many rabbit breeders and owners are dealing with the uncertainties that are involved with the outbreaks of rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Um, I wanted to assure everyone that the, the ARBA has been in constant contact with the government agencies and our colleagues to, making, to make sure that we are up to date and informed on what's going on. And, and these are difficult times because there are people that live in areas where the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus has been confirmed. And then there are other people that live in areas that they're concerned that it might go into their area. One of the questions that we have right now that we don't have an answer to is, what is the virus going to do as it mutates? And what's the virus going to do over the winter? And that's, those are two of the big things that we're trying to gather more data on so that we can help make informed decisions. Um, there are many other questions that people are asking, such as the use of vaccines and should this be allowed? And that's part of the reason why I wanted to meet with everyone tonight and provide them an update on the items that we do know and to uh, at least make sure everybody is informed on where we are right now. The question concerns the ARBA quarantining. And this is really a difficult question to answer because the ARBA really has no authority to issue a quarantine. Only state governments can issue quarantines. And the current ARBA policy has been to put some sanctions in place that would hopefully help alleviate risk. And that's been our goal the whole time is how do we minimize risk and make sure that we don't have a spreader event or a rabbit show where the agent may spread because it may very well be that you don't have the virus in your area, but you may go through an area where you might be able to pick up the virus or someone else will. So we're trying to make sure as an association that only controls sanctions for shows that we can hopefully prevent super spreader events and minimize the risk to all rabbit and KV enthusiasts. And we, and we empathize with what, what's been going on and the lack of the ability for some of our folks to go to shows. But I think it's obvious that the policy in place on exhibition and sanctions within the radius as defined have helped limit the spread of, of the virus. Well, anyone that is not up to date or wants to refresh themselves on the recommendations, not only from the ARBA, but also from our, our government agencies and colleagues that we're working with, I recommend you visit the ARBA website for articles that are posted there as well as the ARBA Facebook page or past issues of our Domestic Rabbits magazine, which are all excellent references for information on biosecurity and just what each state that has had a confirmed case uh, is doing to control the virus at this time. And if you have additional questions, you may want to contact uh, your district director for your state. One question that we have received is what can the ARBA do? What can we do as an association to help get a vaccine for rabbit hemorrhagic disease, specifically the, the isolate we have here in the United States right now is rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two. And I can tell you, I've been in contact with USDA, who is the agency that would license an animal vaccine here in the US. And I've been con in contact with vaccine manufacturers here in the US. They're aware of our interest and we've relayed that to the federal government that we're, we are interested in helping. The one thing that is very difficult is for licensure of a product costs a great deal of money. You're talking several hundred thousand dollars. And even if the ARBA is able to help generate some financial assistance, the money we might be able to generate would just be a drop in the bucket. I don't know how much we might be able to generate. However, we are helping vaccine manufacturers and people in the licensure product, a licensure of products to be aware of what might be needed to license the vaccine. I've talked to a couple people as far as study design, um, how many animals they may need for the studies and stuff, as well as working with the folks at USDA. So 
I can tell you that the ARBA as an association, I'm not sure how much we could do for generating funds. One for us to help licensure, one thing that might be frustrating is even if we generate the funds to help get a product license, that doesn't mean we would get a discount on use of a vaccine. So it's a very complicated issue. I can tell you that the government is aware that the ARBA would like to help and we're willing to help and we're staying in contact to hopefully help move the process along so that we can get a product licensed here in the United States that could be manufactured here in the United States and once manufactured could be available for use for anybody that would want it. How can people in states where there is no rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus positive cases at this time, how can they get access to vaccine to protect their animals? And that's a very difficult uh, issue to address. First off, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus is categorized as a foreign animal disease, and which means that the government's methodology for controlling it right now is eradication if possible. You know, if you don't have to vaccinate uh, or have a vaccine and live with the disease, why do it? That's, their, that's been their strategy thus far, is if it's an animal or a premise is found positive, then the disease is eradicated. Now, the only way to change that would be for our Congress to pass a resolution to change the status of rabbit hemorrhagic disease or dis give some dispensation that rabbits would be excluded from this. And the chances of that happening are pretty remote. So the alternative then would be making sure that we keep the biosecurity measures up and wait while there is a vaccine made. And, and one point that I want to emphasize is, is each state is sovereign. And just because one state says that they're going to allow vaccine doesn't mean another state, if there's an outbreak, would. So it's very difficult dealing with these outbreaks and the variances from state to state because each state can set up their own plan for control and eradication and as we've seen several states when there's been an outbreak they've allowed importation of unlicensed vaccine or vaccine from a foreign country to be used in the borders of that state for limited use all states have not done that and there's there's no uh, measure that would allow the federal government to force states to do that. So that's something we just have to keep working with on a state by state basis. And if we're gonna to continue to have outbreaks, then we're gonna to have to continue to support our colleagues and hopefully get a, vi a vaccine licensed and manufactured here within the borders of the United States. One question that we received concerned how things are done in Europe in comparison to here in the United States. And I think it's important when we first start talking about Europe to realize that there are many nations in Europe, all of them don't have a, the same government system we do. I mean, they, we hear reports that the UK allows animals to, if you have a positive, you can't go to a show in the UK for 120 days. Well not all governments are set up the same and the government in the UK is different than the government here in the USA. Same way with the reporting structures. Not all countries report outbreaks the same as others. And it would be great if we had a licensed vaccine here in the US, but Europe does. So it's very difficult for us to compare strategies and management practices in one area or one country, even the UK, as well as the rest of Europe, to what we have here in the US, because unfortunately, we do not have a vaccine right now. So uh, at least a vaccine licensed in the US for use. So it's very difficult for us to even comment on what we could change and how we could do things for the, like they do in the UK. The policy we have here in the US is right now for the ARBA at least is if there's an outbreak in an area, 
then we have limitations and sanctions on being able to go to a show and exhibit on a show for 60 days. And once that 60 days is up, then you would be free to do it. Unfortunately, what we've seen, at least in several of our Western states, our colleagues have found outbreaks in several different times and it's limited that use. But the ARBA policy right now is for um, a 60 day um, restriction for going to shows. And, and at least from the, from the appearance of the outbreaks, we're seeing an impact at least on ARBA member rabbits themselves, our, our recommendation has worked very well. We haven't seen a number of outbreaks in our domestic rabbits shown by ARBA members. Now, unfortunately, we're still seeing some in wild rabbits, but at least it appears that our policy has worked to help diminish the number of outbreaks in domestic rabbits. We received a question that addressed uh, 16 of 64 counties in Colorado that have had rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus cases, as well as our seven or eight southwestern states being positive. And while we empathize with and appreciate that the, the members in those areas have helped to limit the spread of the virus, one bright thing that I can tell you we hope to see is the the USDA, our government, has been collecting data on outbreaks now for almost a year, and we hope to evaluate this, all the data they have, and what they want to do is do some sequencing of these viruses and see what changes we are seeing and what differences there are of the viruses between the different outbreaks and evaluate the epidemiology, you know, how the, how the, how the virus spread, how it's transmitted and stuff, we hope to do that by the end of first quarter this year. And at that time, hopefully, we can glean some new information that will help us make some science-based decisions. I think the most important thing to remember through all of this time we've been dealing with it is, is the ARBA has been focused on maintaining the safety of our members and the safety of their, of their animal herd. So, I think we've done a good job from that and it's taken everybody in the ARBA to help do it. It hasn't been easy and I know it's been a stress on some people, but hopefully once we get some more data and we see what this virus is doing, then we can change some of our policies working with our government friends. I know one of the big things we want to find out is, you know, the United States, we're a big, con big country and we have lots of different climates. And we have, we had outbreaks in the last year, clear from Washington. We had one in Florida. We've had them in the Midwest there in, in Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and the Southwest. These are very different climates. So one of the things that USDA and I know myself and other scientists are curious is to find out is, how did the virus overwinter? Has it made any more mutations? Has it spread? as it hopefully died out in some areas. So those are the type of things that we're gonna hopefully be able to get some data on here this spring. And when the government and the ARBA working with them can evaluate the data, hopefully we'll be able to make some decisions going forward that will uh, help make some changes in our ARBA policies. Another question that we received was uh, people that live in the Southwest and have lived with this virus for a while, would the ARBA consider letting them set policies to have some internal shows? And I guess currently our recommendation would be no, we would not consider that. However, we are waiting, as I just said, that there are um, some discussions going on right now with the government and as they continue to gather data Hopefully we'll be able to learn some more things about the virus itself and how to control it and maybe even eradicate it in some areas that will hopefully free up some of us to be able to go to more shows. One thing that I think is important to remember is, is that the, the rabbit management is very different around the world. In other countries, they may not have the same management styles we do, the same intensities, 
you know, some different associations may have different requirements as far as if there is a vaccine, maybe some associations could mandate you have to vaccinate. And even then it might not be easy to get everyone to vaccinate their animals. So I wanted to assure everyone that right now, even though we've had some talk about the ARBA generating money for, for lobbying and stuff, we are a nonprofit organization. So we really can't lobby, but we can educate and we surely can support people that are out there trying to help get a vaccine licensed. Or the other thing I think is most important is continue to continue to educate all rabbit enthusiasts about this virus itself. Now, one thing we have seen is quite a few people trying to uh, write letters, petitions, and call some of our government agencies. And I can tell you from experience that that really doesn't seem to help much because these same people that people are writing letters to and calling, those are people that have jobs and are trying to help us. And if we let them do their job, they might be able to help us even more. So I'm not trying to discourage anyone. I'm just trying to make sure everybody has that realization that at the end of the day, the ARBA board, who are rabbit breeders, rabbit enthusiasts, as well as all of our other members, we care and we're doing our best to help work through this unfortunate situation. And hopefully in the near future, the threat will be diminished and we'll all be able to go to shows more, more, uh, more easily. And I, and I would once again recommend anybody that wants to get more up to date on this uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus or the whole situation itself to please visit the ARBA website, the ARBA Facebook page, and read Domestic Rabbits magazine past issues so they can be up to date as we continue to do our best as an ARBA board and association for the best interest of all rabbit enthusiasts everywhere.